Hello, my name is Temi Bailey. For the past three years, I have been the Boys of Color Coordinator as well as the MECO Academic Advisor for the past two at Swan Scott High School. With me today, I have Tyler Sanders. Hey guys, I'm Tyler. I'm a freshman, I'm 15 years old. Samuel Obala. I'm Sam, I'm a freshman and I'm also 15 years old. Alison Bangura. Hey guys, I'm Al, I'm a senior and I'm 18 years old. And Eddie Gomez. Hi, I'm Eddie, I'm a junior and I'm 17 who are all members of the ROC Male Affinity Group Boys of Color, which was started in my first year at Swampscott. A fun fact that you guys might not have known is that we are the only high school in Massachusetts with a senior center connected to it. Over the month of February, also known as Black History Month, we spoke to four senior citizens at the center who were lucky enough to live through an important part of our history where one man took the initiative to lead the charge to help change the world not just for him and his family, but for all people of color. These individuals have been lucky enough to not only be alive for the first civil rights movement, but also experience the reignition of the fight after the murder of George Floyd. We have taken the time to interview four individuals all representing different demographics. One black male, a black female, a white male, and a white female. We did this to ensure different perspectives were represented and to also get as many viewpoints as possible. Thank you and I hope you enjoy. Today we have Ralph Edwards, Victoria Wilder, Sid Novak, and Edie Baker, who will be sharing his perspective on the evolution of the black experience, which was spearheaded by Martin Luther King Jr., to the status of today and recent civil rights movements, and the civil rights movement that was recently initiated by the death of George Floyd. So Ralph, how are you doing today? I am very good and very pleased to, to be here. Can I ask how old you are? In two months from today, I'll be 96. I was born in, on September 17th, 1954. I'm 77. 100 minus 26 years old. Quick math, you got me. I don't know, I gotta do 74, thank you. Um, so uh, where are you from, where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, Louisiana. I've been on the North Shore for about 45 years and in Swampscott for about 16 years. I was brought up in Lynn. I grew up in Lynn. And I was born and brought up in Swampscott. But uh, I grew up in Louisiana, Alexandria. Uh, Louisiana, which is right in the middle of the state. That's great. That's great. Um, so today I'm just going to ask you a couple questions and uh, just speak your mind. Growing up, were you ever a witness to any experience of racism, like, firsthand? Well, that's an interesting question. I grew up in Swampscott. Uh, it was, I was uh, very involved in my own Jewish religious community, and I really didn't experience any kind of racism or prejudice because it was a small community. But since then, I have had some experiences. To be honest with you, I didn't have any racism experiences concerning black people mm -hmm. because there were not that many people in Lynn at that time. I really have not. And especially I was thinking back to when I was younger, we were all my school was integrated, my church was integrated, and the neighborhood kids, we all all the kids in the neighborhood went to the neighborhood school. Mm -hmm. And growing up, I didn't have any fears like that at all. <laughs> I well, uh, you know, I, I was born in 1947. Uh, I'm growing up in Louisiana, where apartheid was practiced. I mean, our communities were totally segregated. Uh, you know, uh, the neighborhood I lived in was, was all black. Uh, three blocks away, there was Lee Street, and on the other side of Lee Street is where uh, the white community uh, began. The schools I went to, uh, everything was was totally segregated. So, wow. yeah, that, I mean that was the the norm. My experience uh, with racism has to do more with my outside world. My granddaughter is biracial, and she's now 21. And when she was growing up. She had many incidents living here in Swampscott where she felt uncomfortable. And it used to make me furious because she was brought up in a, a home uh, where social justice, as I was brought up and our children were brought up, social justice was so important. And when she would call her mother from the mall to say she's being followed, people think she's stealing. That's an experience that I had never had. But through her, my rage grew. Where were you and how did it feel on August um, 1963 when Martin Luther King made his I Have a Dream speech? 
So I was nine years old then, and I really don't remember much about that. However, our church had um, would send groups of people so down south to help with the protesting, and my mom had gone a few times. And I was very scared because on TV, I was seeing the people being attacked by the dogs, being hosed. I was afraid for her, and I just, my life was so different here. I just, as a young child, I just couldn't understand why there were differences like that, because everything was the opposite for me. And I don't know of many people from my town who went to Washington at, at the time, but certainly we were impressed at so many people and, and were, were in D.C. For, uh, for the March on, on Washington. Well, I had just turned 19, and I was beginning my sophomore year at Syracuse University as a theater major. And we were just sure we were right. Everything is right, what we were doing. And we were furious about the fact that a dream, a speech like this, wasn't received as well as it should have been then. I was most impressed about the speech. As a matter of fact, uh, I knew a couple of people that were on the march with him. It was very, very surprising, the number of people that didn't march with him. And uh, it just goes to show you, things can be good for people, but things can be bad for people. Let's face it, we're not all the same. And it's a doggone shame that people have prejudices and everything like that. What occurred after the speech? Was there anything, any, any, any changes you noticed? No, not, not after the speech, so to speak. Because, you know, looking back historically, it's, it was a major event, and people are seeing it as a major speech. But, uh, you know, at the time, it was... Just a regular day. It was just a, a regular speech. A spectacular day, and King's generally spectacular speech. It, it, it didn't stand out then as it does now. Well, there were changes because a year after that, the Civil Rights Act was passed. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the laws are written down, but if the people don't change, a lot is not going to change. You know, people were still fighting, you know, the way of life that they were used to before the Civil Rights Act. Um, but it certainly was a change that was a long time in coming and it needed to happen. I didn't see too much change. There's a lot of chatter. It's always a lot of chatter, you know. Um, uh, it makes you crazy, you know. People could be protesting, but it's the, the work behind the scenes that makes the difference in making any kind of change. But it's complicated. And because things are complicated, sometimes people don't stick with it. For me, uh, and, and, you know, the younger people, we were more interested in what uh, John Lewis had to say because, you know, he was the, um, um, you know, the youthful speaker. He was head of the Southern SNCC, uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was the one who was uh, talking about revolutionary change. Yeah, he and, had the fire so in him. He had the right, fire Right, right. Are you aware of the, the George Floyd incident? The, uh, are yeah. you aware of that? So what do you think? Do you think there's any, like, sort of comparison from MLK when he had his speech or that time being to now? Or what do you think? Do you well, think you see what's happening nowadays anyhow. Yeah. Uh, and even the police in uh, the higher Russian ones, like a commander of a, you know, of a group of police and stuff like that, they, they they even said things have to change. Yeah. And they haven't been changing. Well, I see some differences. I know the, the uh, protesters now, I think, are much more diverse and they're more about inclusivity. Um, and, you know, when he was, when Martin Luther King, um, during his time, um, it was mostly men that were spear, spearheading that movement. Mm -hmm. And now it's just, anyone you know anyone and everyone anyone which i think is really good right which i which i think is better because so many people i think are seeing that you know things are not fear all that systemic racism that's been going on mm -hmm. you know it has to stop and to me it's simple it's just not right yeah. do you see any comparisons because um you know in 2020 
there we had the death of George Floyd, and that kind of sparked an up, uproar in our people throughout the year. We were um, very active, and um, I would like to I would like I would consider that my generation civil rights movement because other than that, I didn't really see that kind of huge amount of people coming together. Honestly, in my whole life, I don't really think I have. So for me, that was what I call my civil rights movement. I feel like George Floyd's was more to expose the, the, the hidden racism and the, and the kind of systemic racism and um, kind of all the underlying things that come with being a black man in America. So do you see any other comparisons? Part of the significance of, of the murder of George Floyd was it was on television. Uh, it was, uh, you know, because of the phone. Somebody yep, took that girl, yep. p p picture of it. In America, there's been a history of the murder of black men and and women, and uh, and and when we testify to it, you know, no one listens. The, uh, the oftentimes a a weapon was put next to the person, and you know it Boom, was justifiable, and and so on. What is very positive in, in that particular outcome was the overwhelming uh, support of the white community in, uh, in opposing uh, uh, that, that, that murder. Uh, there were many times since then driving uh, here on the North Shore and driving through, well, towns like Swampscott or, or Ipswich where very small black population but you've got 20 people from that community, uh, you know, out holding signs, Black mm -hmm. Lives Matter. So the way that it, it sort of informed white folks about uh, uh, what, what, what can happen and their constructive response is, is something that uh, is positive. I think we're doing better, but we're not doing enough. We have to keep doing more. It's not easy. You feel like you want to just hang it up and say, you know, let's go to Aruba or let's go to a dance. And that's OK. But you really need to be focused. This next generation needs to be focused on making a change. And you can see change. You can see color. Lots of places where you didn't see color before. Uh, in 1963, on my way to school, uh, we walked past the tree where there was a, a man who had been lynched. Um, yeah. uh, so to know about the murder of black people, uh, that it, it, it wasn't something new. It was, what was new was that it was captured. And, and my generation could say, we've been telling you about this. Yeah. Finally here, you can see it yeah. for yourself. And the callousness, I mean, he didn't even, I mean, he knew he was being filmed. He knew that all these people saw him, were watching him, and neither he or the other officers seem to it's care about that. One of the wonderful outcomes of that is that term, Black Lives Matter. Do you think racism has found a new face in today's modern world? Yes. Yes, I do. And it's vicious and it's mean. And it needs to be confronted head on with a lot of, with, with words that may be sharp and difficult. And black folks have it more difficult. There's no question. Nobody can sugarcoat that. In the world we live in, it's harder for you. And it will be harder for you. So you need to lead your own world. Don't be led by others. You need to get out there and, and be a leader. It's, it's crazy that a black person in particular can't walk down the street without something up here saying, I hope no cops bother me. Yeah. And he's going nowhere, you know? It, it's a damn shame. And even I try to look into myself too, because now I say to myself, if I see something that I think is not right, I'm going to say something, mm -hmm. you know, because I think that's what people have to do. And it's just out there more. People are videotaping, people are seeing what people are like, mm -hmm. um, you know, and hopefully it will cause some change. Do you have any advice for my generation going forward? I'm about to be 19 this year, so 20 in two years, and I want to make change. What would you say I should do? Interesting. And I'm so serious, by the way. This is not a quite like, I'm so serious. And, and I, I appreciate that. Uh, several, th several things come to mind. 
One is uh, to be aware of the sacrifices that people have made in the past to get us to this point. While uh, you know, so much of, of the conversation will be about Martha, Martin Luther King and what a wonderful uh, man he was and what a visionary he was. Uh, you know, he's the guy who uh, CBS and ABC and the, the cameras are on. Mm -hmm. There are thousands of black folks on that local level who were putting their lives at risk on a daily basis just to yeah. register to vote or to uh, create a new circumstances for their community. There needs to be reforms. And reforms only come when the justices will allow those reforms. And the justices won't allow the reforms until you have the justices there. Justices there by being appointed by election officials. officials. So you need to register to vote. You need to vote. You need to understand the system. And it isn't easy. Democracy is the worst, most difficult form of government. But it's what we have and it's the best. Make sure you know what's going on in the world and speak up when you see things are wrong because when you don't speak up, why is it going to stop? It's mm -hmm. just going to keep snowballing, snowballing all the way. You have to create spaces where people feel comfortable saying, you know, look, this is not right. The other that comes to mind is um, to always strive to, to do your best. Now, and you, maybe you can straighten me out on this because when I was growing up, uh, to work hard, to be a good student, to excel, people applauded that. And it's my understanding that, that, that there's sometimes when if a, a, a black student is excelling, even other black students will, hey, he's a nerd, she's a nerd. Yeah, and I mean, it's just, that just, for me, that like those, that black on black is kind of, is kind of another example of the racism getting embedded into the system, into the system. Because it's like, just because he's a black student getting a good grades, now you should put him down. Like, that's, that makes no sense. Black on black, we should be uplifting each other, you know exactly. what I mean? One, one analogy I always give to like being a black man in America is kind of like, you basically start the race. Like, um, so 18 is the, is the starting line. And on your way to 18, you're approaching the starting line and you're getting ready to go, you're collecting all your tools, like you're fixing your car up, you know what I mean, to start your race. Right. Uh, the difference between being a black man and being a uh, and being a white man in America, though, is that the white man he has the pit crew, he has the premium gas, he has the decked out ties. You know what I mean? Super grip on him. Black guy got a go kart. He don't got no pit stop. Maybe he got his mom, his single mom, who's fighting every day. Maybe he got his dad. You know what I mean? Right. Maybe he got his family, but he got that go kart. He got a he got a toolbox. You know what I mean? A couple of stuff. Right. Right. And, and, and the reason why I say it's before the starting line is because it is, because I'm not one of those pick me people though, because now it's like, oh, as black people, oh, we're behind. Now let's just sit back. Now let's just, nah, we, we're already at a disadvantage anyway. No, that's where I have that disagreement because I said the starting line, right? When you get to the starting line, it's all about your willpower. Try to put yourself in another person's boots. Yeah. What if you were born black? 